Great, welcome everyone. Um, I think from the look of the gallery, most of you know who I am. I'm Keith, I'm the Dean of the Architecture Division here at CCA. I wanna thank you all for joining us today for this special event hosted by CCA NOMAS. At CCA, we understand land acknowledgement as a transformative act meant to confront our place on native lands and to build mindfulness of our present participation in colonial legacies. CCA campuses are located in Wichin and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of Chichenyo and Ramatu Shaloni peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of the communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those from the lands on the lands from which you're joining us virtually today. I'd also like to take a moment now to acknowledge the horrific recent events that remind us of the urgency of addressing the longstanding crises of racism and white supremacy in this country. The murders in Atlanta of eight people. Yep. The murders in Atlanta of eight people, including six Asian women, and the increasing number of anti-Asian attacks, both here in San Francisco and across the country, make clear that we must all raise our voices to condemn and denounce the racism, xenophobia, and violence that, that continue to plague our society. As a community, we stand in support and solidarity with our Asian and Asian American students, faculty, and staff, and affirm, as CCA President Steve Beal said in a message last week, that you deserve to feel, to feel and to be safe respected and free from violence and hate. As a caring community, we extend compassion to those among us who are experiencing trauma or grief. And as creative citizens, we must each, we must each act with urgency to address and dismantle the complex systems of oppression that diminish us all. And with this, our spring 2021 architecture lecture series titled Remaking, we've been hosting innovative thinkers and makers to reflect upon the work we must all do now to remake our practices and co-imagine a safe, just, and equitable future for everyone. Today, as part of this series, it's my great pleasure to have Biz Zhang, Celeste Martour, Kevin Moultrie Day, and Jason Campbell join us for a conversation with members of the CCA chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architecture Students about their individual practices and their work as a collective space industry. And please join us next Tuesday as the series continues with the lecture presented by CCA Architecture History Theory X Lab by Shannon Mattern at noon on Tuesday. You can find the full spring lecture series along with stories by and about our students, faculty, and alumni at scaffold.architecture.cca.edu. And we just published an interview with Anamo Yachi of MIT who spoke at the school last spring. So that's a reason to go back to the site if you haven't been there in a while. I'd now like to turn things over to Arturo Gomez, David Rico Gomez, and Kyle Sun of CCA NOMAS to tell you more about NOMAS and to introduce our speakers. Gentlemen. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Luis Arturo Gomez Escobedo, and I'm a current president of our CCA NOMAS chapter. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Before we move on, I would like to raise awareness of our latest acts against uh, the Asian community that has sparked a lot of discomfort, fear, and anger among many. I want to state that CCA NOMAS stands in solidarity with our Asian community. These hate crimes will not be tolerated in our community. We will stand together and move forward from these challenging times. It's time to move forward the conversations. We have had too many conversations of what the problem is, and it's time to start thinking about what the solution could be. In order, in order to honor the pain, frustration, and anger that we are all facing, we would like to ask every single one of you to participate in a minute of silence. Let's use that minute to pray, reflect, and meditate to stand in solidarity with the victims and the targeted community and against these hates of crime. And we will start now.
Thank you everyone for participating. Without further ado, I would like to pass it down to David to continue with our event. Thanks for that incredible um, message, Arturo. It's really powerful. In times like these, uh, you know, it reminds us to, that solidarity is truly is key. And really this is why the work that we try to do at NOMAS is uh, so important. So. We are CCA's chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architecture Students, and we aim to serve as a student collective to advocate for diversity in design education and to create discussions in regard to equity and equality within the educational and professional architecture and landscape architecture fields. Through engagement with diverse perspectives, community involvement, and building fellowship, um, we, at, we as a group, um, develop professionally and uh, try to work, raise awareness. This lecture and panel discussion following marks the first of a new NOMAS lecture series held in parallel as one lecture each term in conjunction with the architecture division. We're currently searching for, uh, before, like, before we begin, uh, I'd just like to make an announcement that uh, NOMAS is searching for um, you know, student leaders. And so please uh, reach out to us at our website, um, if you, you know, if you want to join us with our messages and our cause. Now um, I'm going to pass it on to to Kylie, our operation director, who's going to introduce um, uh, our guest today. Hi everyone, I'm Kaylee, the operations director, and I'd like to introduce our speakers before we begin. Brenda Zhang, a uh, bees is a designer, artist, organizer, and educator based on Tongva land, which is modern day Los Angeles. They organize with the Design as Protest Collective and Dark Matter University, as well as teach at the California College of the Arts. Bees received a Master's of Architecture from the University of California at Berkeley. Celeste Martor is an athlete, performer, researcher, and designer who uses narrative and physical space to uplift, complement, and care for the Black body. She's a dual master's in architecture and master in design studies candidate at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. She's also a center midfielder for the UC Berkeley women's soccer team. Jason Campbell is an interdisciplinary designer, leveraging his experience in architecture, photography, and exhibition design. He earns a sole art and design practice, CLL, and is an active member of the UC Berkeley architecture faculty, teaching design studios in the undergrad and graduate levels. Kevin Bernard Moultrie Day, is an architectural and spatial designer whose work sees architecture as a means of cultural and social intervention. His work focuses on how class, climate change, race, and violence manifest themselves in space time and how to rebuild those systems. Her work together as Space Industries was featured in Architect Magazine's Next Progressives in 2020, and they were also participating artists in Gray Area Foundation's 2019 and 2020 Experiential Space Research Lab. They have also been published in Ground Up Avery, Shorts, Architizer, and Failed Architecture. Now I'd like to invite Bees, Celeste, Jason, and Kevin for a series of short Pachacuchas before a conversation. So Bees, please take it away. Awesome, thank you. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Bees and I'm so happy to be sharing this time and space with you today. Uh, and thank you again to CCA NOMAS for creating the space for this conversation and with the CCA Architecture Division as well and all of you for coming together virtually with us in this ongoing crisis within crisis within crisis moment. And I hope you're all taking care. Coming together with you all has given me an opportunity to reflect on practice and what it is that we even mean by practice, a word that comes from the Greek for pertaining to action and the Latin to carry out action. And I'll come back to this in a minute. But first, when we show up to architecture, what are we asked to leave at the door? 
as students, as workers, as teachers, as caretakers, as siblings, as survivors. Recognizing that our discipline, like others in the Western tradition, are both imagined and therefore porous spaces that do not actually exist separate from our society and world, and is directly descended from Western imperialism. The exclusion of our identities, experiences, stories, visions, hopes, and knowledges is felt deeply by us, that is the majority of the world, as harm, alienation, isolation, and structural violence. And it's also entirely architecture's loss when this discipline silences, erases, and forces our exits through micro and macro aggressions rooted in systems and histories of oppression. As students, my generation in the US was sold an individualistic, exceptionalist, racist, and capitalist narrative that we could be anything when we grew up regardless of identity and that it was our fault if we could not. Instead, I wish I had been taught sooner what Toni Morrison teaches us about our responsibility, that if we are free, we need to free somebody else. As a queer non-binary femme Chinese diasporic organizer whose practice includes architecture, I'm actually not here to convince anybody to participate in or practice in the discipline of architecture. The burden is on the discipline to convince us that its practice is relevant to our practices of dreaming, of surviving, of communal care, coalition building, and collective liberation. When those in the discipline are silent and when they fail to take action against injustice, they are complicit. So as we build towards justice, what can we actually count as architectural practice that which pertains to action if so much of what we see in contemporary architectural practice consists primarily of inaction? Now I'm assuming that everyone on the call is still on some level interested in cultivating a practice of architecture. Me too. So the idea here is that we must continue to contribute to movements for collective liberation from whichever identities we hold and whichever positions we find ourselves in. It takes all of us to disrupt and dismantle white supremacy, racial capitalism, settler colonialism, Western imperialism, cis heteropatriarchy, ableism, and all systems of oppression, especially from an elitist white collar discipline like ours. So in the brief time I have, I'll give a few examples. In my own design teaching and research, I ask how disciplinary tools of architecture can be used for building new social and physical constructions of place. In Western society, we strive to represent spaces that interest us and fail often dangerously to represent those that do not. So here, a conventional way of seeing and knowing the freeway, privileging vehicular access, softening historical trauma, Freeways are almost ubiquitously represented by flattening their lanes to approximate other roads rather than to acknowledge what they are, which is concrete monoliths that are used as tools of a settler colonial state to displace communities it considers disposable in service of capital and war. And here, just another way of seeing and knowing the freeway by applying a conventional four foot above finished floor horizontal section to the 580, 880 interchange in Oakland, California to reveal entire city blocks of crochet, and another by choosing to see what has been torn from the urban fabric. Seeing the freeway differently by using the same architectural tools to make visible the violence of freeway infrastructure at a human scale. From left to right, the on-ramp at 35th and West, the underpass near MacArthur Bart, the hill by the Walgreens, the colonnade by Eli's. What stories can we tell just by shifting the bounding boxes or the frames? And the as built as a tool for the construction documentation of ruin and decay rather than and regrowth rather than as an implement of capitalism. So allowed to hang loose, no need to change filters, new directions, optional stacking, reason unimportant, allow overgrowth, do not maintain. By encountering unconventional places as as built with found conditions to be surveyed and verified in field. Can we hone in on qualities, limits, potentials of place that can be recorded through architectural tools, but often are overlooked in conventional practice? One more as built, the Stones oil rig operated by Shell in the US Gulf of Mexico and currently the deepest deep sea oil and gas project in the world. And understanding that this oil rig in particular was such a challenge to draw, not really because of scale, which we can handle as architects, but rather because of the intentional obscuration by extractive fossil fuel industries to not allow us as the public to understand what these structures look like or how big they are. And just for fun, a project about the myth of white racial innocence. 
as we rush to diversify our architectural entourage, how do we also accurately portray the specific whiteness of our architectural designs? Then on a collective level, how do we co-create and use our positions and platforms creatively and critically? So as mentioned, Space Industries has written and spoken on racial injustice in architecture for numerous publications and conferences, but as well not pictured here for confidentiality, one of our most meaningful projects as Space Industries was pro bono work we did for a San Francisco based racial justice nonprofit undergoing an eviction process in the Tenderloin in 2018. And we supported them with walkthroughs as built and schematic design drawings, our tools, as they navigated their search for a new office home. And on a national level, I'm a core organizer with the Designers Protest Collective. I see a few of you on here a black, brown, indigenous, and Asian-led collective of anti-racist designers using direct action, research, storytelling, mutual aid, and field organizing to demand design justice and challenge the power structures that use architecture and design as tools of oppression. Last year, Space Industries initiated the Anti-Racism Design Resources document that we continue to compile and publish through DAP. And as an organizer with Dark Matter University, a democratic network of BBIA plus architectural workers, I'm co-teaching with an incredible team this semester, our inaugural seminar titled Foundations of Design Justice, which we're offering across five schools. We collaboratively created this class to challenge hegemonic pedagogies, canons, and epistemologies that are drawn from paradigms of white domination, and also to model new forms of knowledge, knowledge production, and resource distribution between institutions. So back to the question of practice. Architectural practice allows us to operate as both visualizers of space, real and imagined, and as movers of capital, labor, material, and embodied energy. We draw the same lines with little to no accountability for what those lines might mean across disciplines or cultures or species or scales. However, we're also uniquely positioned to take action. Writing on use, theorist Sara Ahmed explores the banality of power reproducing itself. In our discipline, this shows up in the minutia, details and specifications pulled from one project to the next, as well as in the hegemonic narratives that we maintain about place, who designs it and who benefits from it. And as I am personally processing the legacies of white sexual imperialism, racialized misogyny and trans misogyny, class warfare, and anti-Black white supremacy and militant nationalism that created and perpetuated the violence that murdered six Asian women in Atlanta and so many other lost loved ones across time and space, I am profoundly grateful for the Black, Brown, Indigenous, Asian, trans, queer, disabled, and working class leaders and ancestors that fought to open the door and keep the door open for me and for you. And so I urge all of us who have ever been asked to leave part of ourselves at the door to deeply invest in ourselves and in each other to cultivate practices that use architecture as a tool set to tell other stories, to tell historically othered stories, to tell our stories, and to practice telling our stories together. Thank you. That's it for me. Thanks so much, Thanks. Um, give me a second to work out the sound. Okay. All right, um, so hi everyone, my name is Celeste. Um, thank you for having me. I'm super happy to be in virtual space with you, um, especially in times where our community is um, so deprived. Um, so before going to grad school, I worked as a set designer. Um, I read a lot of scripts and one day I'll take a better picture of all of my books of marked up scripts, but um, I think this diagram, diagram will do to explain. So the first step of my job is to pine the text for nouns and adjectives that reveal circumstances about the imagined world where the narrative is supposed to take place so that eventually I can create those worlds or image them. Um, every object I place in the frame or on a stage has a purpose. It carries a legacy. It tells its own story and sometimes explains the entire plot having a narrative arc all of its own. So if I pull the noun cup 
from the script, there are many different variations on a cup. So to illustrate this a little further, um, I know exactly where I am if I'm drinking out of that flamingo goblet. I know possibly what decade we're in if I'm drinking out of the white and blue paper cup. And I can probably tell you what month it is based, based on the cup on the right. Objects speak, they have a voice, they speak to us, and in return, we identify with them. And also, they speak for us. So I have a similar fixation with objects in the cityscape. I look at how we contend with stories of the past and the present through the objects we navigate around. My work has become somewhat archival. I look at origins and arrivals. I look at sites of stress, lifespans, and I ask how architecture creates narratives of out of place and in place. I'm gonna tell one story today about the arrangement of objects in a parking lot. And I wanna think about how we can read the resulting image of the city as an alternative architectural framework. This is Curly's Half Bay. Uh, it's in Signal Hill, a city in Southern California surrounded on all sides by Long Beach. It's the southernmost point of Los Angeles County. The US Census shows a median household income of 73,000 and a population that is almost 70% people of color. So we're looking at a functioning restaurant, even throughout COVID, that is flanked on two sides by functioning pump jacks, which are actively depleting the earth of its crude oil deposits. California has a really strange relationship to energy. I think California uses about one sixth of all um, jet energy fuel in the United States, but they have the least amount of um, carbon emissions from, um, from homes. So the basin called Los Angeles is apparently ripe for oil extraction. Um, the US Energy Information Administration reported that from 1985 to 2020, Southern California oil production has decreased from 100,000 barrels a day to around 400,000, which is still a lot. Um, however, the evidence of this bounty lies most visibly in the neighboring cities of Carson, Wilmington, and Long Beach. By refusing to reject big oil subterranean interests, the city of Long Beach has codified the oil industry as precious, assessing the value of material reward as greater than an, an urban experience devoid of combustible machinery. So these three architectural objects, the pump jack, the restaurant, and the parking lot are clustered around competing interests in the land, hey, participating in various forms of troubling yeah. So sorry, we're getting a little bit of a feedback. Um, I think it happens when you project a little, you're not even talking that loud, but there's like a little echo that's happening. I'll speak quieter. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll speak quiet. Let me know if you need me to repeat anything. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll start from, so um, let's see. So these, um, these three architectural objects, the pump jack, the restaurant, and the parking lot are clustered around competing interests in the land, and they're participating in various forms of troubling enterprise and conquest, but also they're shaping the story of a home. And that's what's most harrowing about this wide shot, actually, is the ease in which it coexists. You'll see that Jeep's just sort of like snuggled in between where people are eating and the site of active oil extraction. Um, so I'm interested in how bodies flow around these active sites of colonial terror and how these adjacencies produce an image of civic life that is intertwined with depletion and resource extraction. When I first saw this scene, I was, I, I, my jaw dropped. I drove past it and I was like, is this a joke? This must be a mistake. This oil machine is combustible and there are people eating within, within 20 feet of it and a kitchen at least within 50 feet of it. Um, so I was, I began thinking about how this happened um, through multiple legacies of colonial terror. Um, we begin, first of all, with the genocide, erasure, and forced removal of the indigenous population, which we will never, ever overlook, um, running on through the gold rush of the mid-1800s, and then in the early 1900s, um, we saw the oil boom, where imperialists divided the land into oil districts. And I don't want to give this too much airtime, but I needed to give it a little context. Um, which leads us to 1960. This is Southern California as told by Shell Oil. This diagram produces a reading of the land as a site of mass extraction. Shell uses the imperial tool of a grid to divide and clear the reading of the land to reflect only utility and profit. 
As we know, the oil industry is vast and their competitive advantage comes from locating common, the common shared resource and being the first to determine it was their property. So Shell went on to colonize pretty much the entire landscape, Shell and their friends, via an Anglo-American understanding of proprietorship. The story I see, or that's being told here, is that mundane daily routine happens around oil because throughout the 1900s, diversifying economies popped up around it, subsuming oil, and now it's just a capital war over the land. So there are a couple of legal cases and theories that foreground the Anglo-American delusion that shared resources can be owned. The first and most important is Pearson versus Post, um, which, was which was decided in New York City in 1805. So the high level is that Post was pursuing a fox and in the middle of a chase, Pearson came across the fox and took it into possession. The case ruled that a common good becomes property if you deprive it, if you deprive something of its natural liberty to exist. So we can read the conquest of the oil industry in the same vein. And at the core of the debate in pretty much every zoning code I've read is how do legal frameworks infringe and discriminate? The answer certainly in Long Beach lies in this site of conflict where the conquest for mineral deposits enters into conversation with air rights, where capital interest is in tension with above ground civic life. So this capital war can be read across the landscape. Pump jacks and oil derricks pepper are peppered throughout residential neighborhoods. They're in grocery store parking lots, they're on beaches and in areas for recreation. So my neighboring pump jacks are also, they're disembodied signifiers. Um, they index a global network that connects offshore oil rigs processing refineries, and they're just dispersed around the city, sitting in clear geographic conflict with the way of life. Um, so if the first point is about zoning, then the second is about anonymity. I moved to Long Beach as a new resident, as a visitor. I'm from Oakland, and my perception of the city is changed by having fresh eyes. Before moving to Long Beach, I regarded oil only in abstraction, in terms of disasters like the Santa Barbara oil spill, or what oil could buy. The scale and intricacy of the oil industry was unimaginable because I was never acquainted with the point of origin or the process. So these are some Yelp reviews from Curly's. Um, if you've been reading them, most mention something, something about the environment, calling it um, historic or divey, but not one mentions the oil drill or worry around it. Um, I've talked to a few longtime Signal Hill residents and Long Beach residents who hold familiarity with and even endearment of these oil machines as signifiers of home. They are commonplace and comforting, almost they are as commonplace and comforting as palm trees and Lakers flags. Shell oil and its conglomerates remain vague by sitting unnamed and relatively unmarked, becoming unremarkable. There seems to be a con subconscious public rec recognition of the occupation of oil, but effectively, these machines are hiding in plain sight. Even though the scale of a pump jack is impossible to minimize, the oil industry has indeed erased itself through its ubiquity. It's melted into an afterthought, something even to trust in, because it's always been there, humming in the background as storefront shift ownership year by year. The conversation is equally about noticing, but it is also about how home is I, how, how we identify with home by the objects we take comfort in or find familiarity in, and the scales of domesticity as well as the pro proximities to other objects we've inherited adjacencies to. As Sarah Ahmed suggests in her essay, A Phenomenology of Whiteness, we inherit proximities and familiarities as our bodies move past, through, and around objects. We learn to believe and trust in their permanence. We recognize them and even sort of depend on their existence as confirmation, orientation to tell us where home is. So the policy, I'm looking at the policies of what home feels like. I'm gonna play this video over again. Um, here, the visual language or the rhythm of extraction shares the language of survival where longevity depends on procurement. This specific choreography is a relentless commitment to depletion. The monotonous motion also signifies the way capitalism operates, a precise operation that runs in the background, dependent on the effort of individuals who tirelessly, unquestioningly perform their duty. It's a visualization of putting your head down and work hard, mind your own business, don't ask questions, getting your work done. 
So what happens when the oil runs out, or rather when the machine has depleted the land defunct? After oil, Long Beach residents will be left to contend with three types of industrial residue. First is the architectural monument, the 10 by 15 by 30 above ground steel horse army, whose above ground footprint only represents really one one hundredth of its actual size, as one of these is drawing showed previously. The Long Beach, uh oh, not too far. The Long Beach Municipal Government provided a report on the operations of oil and gas management in Long Beach and neighboring cities. They mapped the active, the idle, and the abandoned sites of oil drilling. Qualitatively, you can just read that the abandoned oil wells greatly outweigh the idle and active ones. Second, land use laws and zoning have failed to address the threats of spillover, particulate matter released from carcinogens like benzene around the extraction sites. Third, the lasting image of home that sees the violence of resource extraction as a normal, integral part of the urban experience. This living history, unlike some, so many others, is so evident. And we as critics of the built environment, as Sarah Ahmed has reminded us, cannot take these proximities as a given. Even if it's not about a group of people, it still involves them. So this research is ongoing. Um, I'm looking at how law promotes imperialism, entering into debates on historic preservation, and by con consecrating oil sites as worthy of memory, are we also presenting them permanently? So hopefully the outcome of this research reminds us that our proximities are not fixed nor given, they were inflicted. And my question then becomes what remains? What are we preserving? And then how can we wield the tools of law and architecture to construct safe, just neighborhood, neighborhoods and hold um, yeah, our, our oppressors accountable? That's it for me. Thank you. Hello all, thanks for joining us today. Celeste Bees, thank you for that. Um, makes me super excited, makes me wanna go back to work because I'm, I'm super excited about what I'm seeing right now. Um, super thoughtful, really powerful. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and see if this works well. All right. So I'd like to, to frame this short talk by a current and pressing curiosity and representation, how and what we choose to represent and specifically the inaccessibility of what we produce and the form it takes to make it so. Who our representation is for and the reappraisal of our medium to productively lose control, in doing so making room for alternative visions and constraints. A visionary master's sketch is a lie. It should be co-authored. Again, I ask, who is it for? As contemporary designers, educators, architects, mediators, those concerned with shaping space, an ability for our representation to communicate clearly and reflect unvoiced and hidden narratives is as paramount as it is for them to be generative. And in and of themselves, they are generative. In conversation with Carrie Mae Weems, specifically addressing a body of work capturing family folklore and the construction of home, Bell Hooks makes reference to Audre Lorde's sense of biomythography, describing an intent to go beyond documentation of scientific, linear, or orderly details to explore the gaps, the spaces in shadow, the, the facts that don't allow us, the, the shadows that the facts don't allow us to see, the mystery. In the words of Karime Weems, home for me is both mysterious and mythic, the known and the unknown. Grounded by this understanding and the power of the image and storytelling, I pivoted to the discord and distance found between our lived experiences and the factual projections of space. As reference, the prison map series by Josh Begley. The author and photographic cr critic Teju Cole notes in reference, how quiet these space, these scenes are, how charged by a crisp light, brilliant clarity. They look like insignificant places, but all of them are full of significance for those whose loved ones died there. All are sites of premature death, all are sites where someone was killed and most also indexed and unrestituted crime. Following the thread of the factual area projection, here the use of aerial mosaics and right of way acquisitions 
a primary technique used in site evaluation for divisive infrastructural projects. This collection of images from the Michigan State Highway Commission and granted access from the National Transport Research Organization are each used to illustrate the significance of photogrammetry to actively purchase parcels for road projects. The irony in one of the first few paragraphs of the paper will not be lost on all of you. It notes, immediately after World War I, the people of Michigan demanded a system of weatherproof roads to get them out of the mud. By the middle of the 1950s, their children and grandchildren were demanding a road system that would free them from the strangling python of traffic that had grown up to choke the very life of the state. The aerial became a point of interest due to what has historically rendered invisible by what it could reveal both in time and space. With this in mind, here, thinking about the reappraisal of our representation, a project titled Resilience, a piece that I created that laid bare a one inch code of wood shavings across a highly trafficked corridor floor is understood as an architectural plan outlining the course of action and the destruction of my own personal space. What began as a timid approach to the extension of my private space ultimately revealed traces of a self-possessed subject's trajectory through my space when it, and when it occurred. Leveraging the photo mosaic, reconstructions of a moment in time of my own home, and really an exercise marking the point in which I recognized the plan was inadequate in reconstructing facilitating conversations or charting the narrative of home. This was my attempt to unpack with my mom where I lived, how I lived, both factual and immaterial. Here the success was marked by what felt like a real response. We need to clean more. Sounds like the appropriate response and one that I would never get showing her the actual plan of the space I lived or perhaps the place I worked. What continued to become a series, an ongoing series called Home Productions, I turned to the home where I grew up, found images, artifacts, photographs, family members, here my mom standing next to the handrail of a home I grew up in. And I then deployed the Taylorist method to reconstruct the plan from memory and from family photographs. And here, a recent project, is a design of an artist retreat for friends. Photo mosaic was again used in our attempt to conjure lived experiences as a generative tool. The productive relinquish of control saw priorities shift and the medium revealed and documented new ones over time. I found that the image to be productive also in the design studio. These are select images from a a photo mosaic that I've yet to construct, but I wanted to just make note of some of the traces that you find when thinking deeply about how people live, what they use, what they covet, what they care about. Self-portraits, shrines, daily rituals. In this case, um, perfectly placed on the table and unknowingly um, forms for the domestic partnership that they had just received that day. Those are the traces that should inform our space not the master sketch. We embark on such journeys by first looking for these traces, by gauging the palimpsest that reveals the multi-layered nature of our experience. Another quote taken from Bell Hooks. These techniques, the idea of exploring these traces also found its way into the classroom. Here, two, uh, two projects selected from an undergraduate course both of which required students to go out into the neighborhood, talk to people for a change, speak with people, go to where they live, ask them questions, document, which ultimately led to a proposal that did not start from scratch, but leverage what was existing to build upon it. Here in the shaping of LSF, it was a five-year research project an initiative to create a community art space in the center of San Francisco. A space where the narrative was only formed from the first hand account, 
being in conversation with artists and the community, capturing and archiving work where the use of time-based photographic technique best served in helping us make the next step. Here, sitting on a floor of a dark room with strangers, thinking about conversations and work on isolation, supported by Santos Shelton. Here, one of the clips used during our exhibition with Perspective 50, Urban Divides, is with the, the editors of Urban Divides, where we were looking at divisions within the urban landscape, how infrastructure can be divisive. And here, a video captured by 89's local videographer, beat maker. With this instance, we had to become a record shop to have conversations on art production in the music industry. We were what we needed to be when we needed to be. And that was only born through understanding sites, understanding context, speaking with people, understanding what they need and reflecting that back. The next step is only achieved by acknowledging and reflecting back to our past, reflecting back the realness, our matter, our lived experiences. Only through that does architecture become powerful. And I'll leave you with that. Next slide. Hello, can everybody hear me? All right, thank you. Yep. I would like to say a, a strong thank you, Jason. What an incredible presentation of the work documenting home, both as our own personal construct and the way that we can relate to it. I think as, as these through in the comments, home production means a lot, both to me as a musician and to me as a designer. Um, so uh, like a lot of my colleagues in space industries today, what I'd like to talk to you about is how we can use architecture to talk about things that maybe are not so visible, things that I like to call unobjects. Um, a working definition for working on the other side of time, which is a quote fired by uh, Sun Ra, uh, a musician who filmed, uh, who amongst other things, besides perhaps single-handedly inventing Afrofuturism, um, produced a, a, text, or a, a text and video called Space is the Place in Oakland, California. Um, where he talks about how in order to move forward as a community, African-Americans must start to work on the other side of time. And so with that being said, I'd like to ask the question, what can fill up, fill up a room without taking up any space? Now, this is an old riddle that my grandpa used to tell me and that I've heard multiple times. And the answer for the riddle is light, but it turns out a whole bunch of things can fill up a room without taking up any space, not to mention space. And I think the one that I'd like to focus on for this conversation is time, something that some of my students in the audience will perhaps be very tired of hearing about by now, but it doesn't end here. I'm gonna start with this um, panel from a comic book, one of my favorite ones, Watchmen, where a character, Dr. Manhattan, is musing over his ability to see time and space all at once. And he's reflecting on the fact that when we look at stars, all we ever see are their old photographs, a snapshot in time, projected through space to our eyes in the current day, a time machine built into the sky, built into the world that for most of the time, it seems like we don't actively engage with for what it is, which is a visual time machine. How can we use this kind of lens to look at our own spaces, our own communities, our own neighborhoods, and the own, our own systems that we use to build the world around us? First, I'm gonna start with a project that I, um, published a little while ago called Embodied Energy's Raw Materials, which is a reflection on something that is very, very close to CCA. And when I say very, very close to CCA, I mean it's part of CCA's DNA, it's part of CCA's makeup, and it's also CCA's neighbor, the Permanente Quarry. The Permanente Quarry is a quarry located above Cupertino, um, where most of the cement and concrete used in Bay Area construction projects, including the freeways, 
Shasta Dam up further north and a couple of other massive infrastructural projects left. This is a detail of a drawing that I produced using USGS uh, 3DM data um, that accurately maps the mine for its depth, width, and size. The importance of this is that when you start to look at these as abstracted top, topo, topographical lines, you can start to see that the mine isn't simply just a whole ground, but its relationship to the material being around it. The peaks of the hills and mountains around the mine are voided by the massive, the massive incursion into the ground that we create. This also sets up a really interesting relation when we start to think of it as a process as how are, the, how are all the other iterations of the site manifesting, not just space, but in time. For that, we have to go not just to the way the mine looks today, but a very specific day. Today, which was the same day that Steve Jobs died. On the day that Steve Jobs died, only 50 miles away, uh, there was an active shooter on the campus of the Cupertino mine. Um, Sharif Alman, uh, a black converted um, Muslim worker at the mine, was apparently fed up with the treatment of himself and other workers of color at the mine, which resulted in this horrific shooting. Um, the shooting was hereafter covered up, not very talked about much, completely overshadowed by the other things that the mine is good for, namely building the massive foster and partner structure a uh, spaceship building for Apple's own products yeah. and the uh, CEO of that company is passing. Looking even further back, we can see that this mine, the Permanente mine, which those of you from California will start to be Permanente. Why does that sound so familiar? Well, we'll get to that in a second, but right now I'd like for you guys to transport materials of this mine, not just to San Francisco, but across the Pacific Ocean and back in time to quote unquote, a day that will live in infamy. I'm talking, of course, about Pearl Harbor. The, the quarry, before it even started to be able to provide material for um, San Francisco Bay Area, its first role was in providing the sandbags to protect United States troops from the, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. You can see clearly um, the Permanente tags on the sandbags. But that's not where it stops either. Because if we think about it even further, we start to see that Permanente Mind is by a very famous man, Henry Kaiser. Henry Kaiser is a healthcare magnet in, in the California region and across most of uh, the Pacific coast. Um, and he made his fortune not from healthcare at first, from extractive mining and shipbuilding for the military. So war effort, material extraction, and healthcare are inextricably linked in this, in this portrait that we are building through time of the San Francisco Bay Area mine. This is a photo of the shipyards where, for one of the first times in history, uh, Henry Kaiser desegregated the shipyards, for providing a whole bunch of jobs to non-military people of color, to women and women of color, um, and at the same time, creating a massive profiteering windfall for those who were able to restructure their labor, labor into war profiteering. The next step for me was to take this mine which um, is I've been able to draw with a high degree of accuracy and see an answer for myself, a personal question, which was if all of the material came out of the mine was used to build San Francisco, would it be possible to, to overlay them and see what the relationship is? And it turns out there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the size of the mine, the volume of the material extracted from the mine and actually the size of downtown San Francisco, where most of the concrete went. Um, you can see here the top, top of topographical lines of the mine cutting through and restructuring San Francisco into something both familiar and alien. A new Lake Merritt in the middle of downtown, uh, the freeway cut off, destroyed, and reconstructed simply by returning, returning the favor that we did to the earth back onto our cities. It's not the only way to think about time and space. It's really important that when we, when we look at what we're talking about as an objects, that it's not just about things that we can't see but feel, but also things that have been added to the environment that we may or may not be aware of. This is a, a look at a project that I did in conjunction with the rest of my team 
Space Industries called This Hammer, or because I like long names, This Hammer Killed John Henry, But It Kill Me, a reference to uh, an incredible documentary uh, that James Baldwin did in conjunction with KQED um, on Hunter's Point. And let's start with this. Troubling new find in a section of San Francisco already dealing with concerns about radioactive contamination. KPIX 5's Jackie Ward joins us now to explain why a small object could be making such a big deal. Jackie. Emily, a radioactive object that's about one and a half inches in diameter was found last Friday just feet away from people's homes near the former Hunters Point Naval Shipyard. This is the naval deck marker that was discovered in an undeveloved a area behind a fence an on less than a foot of soil. Effect. The marker was removed on Tuesday by the Navy's contractor along with 10 inches of soil. The public health department says all of the detected radiation was only in the deck marker itself and not the soil. The public health department says some of the students in our class will note it's hardly possible that the effects of that small deck marker were retained in that single object. And it's been documented by the Hunters Point Bio, Bio Monitoring Project that, in fact, the irradiated dust, not just from that object, but from numerous refuse and waste produced by the U.S. military, has been spilling over into the neighborhood, both through dust, air, and other classic means of environmental racism, like freeway placement, as he's mentioned in her presentation, that continue to affect Hunters Point to this day. So, I believe that our role as architects and our our possibilities of, of our field is to use these tools that we have with a representation of seeing a scale and a visualization to start to bring these uh, to the attention of a wider public. So this installation was based on the, the work of the SFK view and the open post to own and historic uh, running to this day, newspapers in the Bay Area that have been documenting the ongoing environmental degradation at Hunter's Point in the form of, uh, of, of their headlines, trying to draw attention to this. And I took those headlines and I turned them into literal beacons of light um, that were programmed with the environmental, the EPA, the EPA's readings of the radioactive object. Um, so that as one approached the, a metaphorical radioactive object, the lights would then respond with the appropriate amount of radiation uh, documented by the Geiger counter. This installation was an attempt by me to revisualize and respatialize information that is actively being despatialized and, and dephysicalized uh, by governments and, and powers that be at play. Uh, it's really important that we start to understand how these things that we think of as not being really objects affect us both in the physical, mental, and social realms. For this last slide, I wanted to provide a quote that I think about a lot um, uh, by Solange. Um, Solange, who one of, one of her most popular songs at the moment is Cranes in the Sky. A lot of people think that that song is about cranes, literal birds in the sky, but it's actually um, a reading, it's a facial reading of Miami and a reading of overdevelopment and lack of care for people and how at a time when so many people were hurting not only was she able to find peace because of her relative uh, wealth and shieldedness from that she was able to reflect on the tension between overdevelopment all of these skyscrapers going up built by cranes built by extraction and what was actually happening on the ground um, and I ask, what can fill up a room without taking up any space? It's time, it's violence, it's space itself, but more than that, it's, it's our intentions. And with those intentions, we can decide what we look at, we can decide what we make visible, and we can turn the objects into something that we can deal with. Thank you guys so much for Thank you so much. Um, Kevin, Celeste, Bees, and Jason, um, I think you've given us all so, so much to think about early. So I'd really like to just first start off our conversation with a question perhaps diving deeper into how space and architecture and as well as your lived experiences have perhaps shaped your perceptions. So Bees, you mentioned how architecture is a vis helps us visualize space, but also help us to move people and ethics in space. Um, Celeste, you mentioned how objects kind of speak for us in a way, and um, 
and I think Jason, you also mentioned lived experiences helping to sh shape your own personal constructs. And finally, Kevin mentioning um, how the, uh, the mind's displacement of space on a mountain also creates new space in San Francisco. So my question to you is this here, as BIPOC designers with unique identities, how have your collective lived experiences and your experiences of space shaped your design work and also shaped your identities for yourself and in the creative practice of space industries? I can go first. <laughs> the, dreaded, the dreaded silence breaker. Um, I, think, I think something that I think about a lot is something that came up in uh, a class that I had with um, Walter Hood which is that um, it was basically just me and Walter and one other Black person in the class. And it was really interesting because what would come up really often is like, there just weren't enough Black people in the class to disagree, you know? Like we couldn't, we had to present a united front because like, you know, God forbid anybody think that, that African-Americans could have different, different uh, perspectives on, on the same, idea and what it kind of brought up and, and the specific conversation I'm thinking of is a conversation we had about a Starbucks and how Starbucks, uh, it was right after people were getting kicked out of Starbucks, if you guys remember that flurry in the news for like two seconds, um, and, and about how Starbucks storefronts are designed to be really transparent and how as, as African Americans, it was just like not actually that helpful. It wasn't, it didn't make it any safer that I had a storefront window made out of glass um, and, and how I think that in, in our work, you'll notice a theme of trying to make the invisible visible because there, there are so many things that are happening to us in our lived experiences that feel so visible. Like I can't think about, I can't think about what it would live, what it would be like to live in a black community without also thinking about my proximity to a freeway or my proximity to environmental degradation. And those are things that aren't seen, um, that aren't represented in architecture. And it doesn't mean that architecture can't represent them. It's because the people who are using the tools haven't been looking. The same way that um, Beezus Project of White Representation is a really great example of what I think about when I think about white people, which is probably not what white people think about when they think about white people. And that works in a lot of different ways. It works also within communities as well, what we see and what we don't see. And so I think that would be a running thread through, through what we're seeing in our presentations and also in our work. One of many threats, to be clear. Yes, thank you for that. I think building off of that, um, what Kevin said about whiteness being the default environment um, and the default way that things, that this world has been constructed around us. And um, going back to your question, um, I grew up non-white, um, still non-white, <laughs> and I, I grew up in, um, an immigrant household where everything around me was full of color and um, it just it didn't look my home and what I was comfortable and familiar with didn't look like the places where I spent most of my time didn't feel the same way that school felt or that museums felt or that grocery stores felt um, and so as a designer I'm drawing from all of these experiences of feeling othered in pretty much every space I um, I and taking the tools that I have learned as Kevin has said to create spaces that um, reflect, I didn't share a lot of my work today, only shared my research, my research but um, the work that I do create are environments that are, that are fake or fictitious and sort of dreaming of places where we would be able to be at peace. Jason? I'll speak up. Oh, nice piece, offering me up. Um, I mean, I, I echo a lot of, of what was just mentioned and to kind of speak from a personal level, this idea of following the traces or being mindful of the traces. Um, there, were, there were certain ways of living for me growing up that I found were um, indicative of a black or colonial um, way of living, um, such as always using the side door. Like that was something that I always sort of recognized in, in black spaces, black homes, my own home. Um, the front living room being the sort of precious zone that you don't use unless like 
you know, we have guests. And even then it's like, uh, who, who's actually coming? And what I find amazing about that is when I step out, right? When I step into spaces that are supposed to be sort of neutral zones, that doesn't carry over, right? There's no like sort of reflection of my lived experience in, in common ground. And there's also not really a reflection of, of some of those traces. There's a sort of cover up that exists when we start to think about how um, black people have informed um, or spaces that have informed how black people live. For example, you know, the, the second entrance or second, you know, drive up window to certain establishments that today are just, you know, bricked up and you can maybe sort of capture the trace of, the, of that sort of colored entrance, but we don't talk about it, we don't address it, we ignore it. Um, and now we sort of adopted primarily the sort of the white existence, the white primary. So as was said before, I think recentering, like finding a way where we become part of that default. Our, our, so we, when we enter space, it's not um, a white experience. It's, you know, it's reflective of who we are, our interests, our cares. Um, that's been pivotal for me in my, my, my own personal practice. And even as, um, as an architect at Smith Group, because I'm, I'm an associate and lead designer um, at a much larger corporation. So thinking about how I start to straddle those lines of the solo personal practice and um, an entity that lives more so in sort of corporate America, um, we've had to have really tough conversations um, internally, but also with our, with our you know, clients, right? Um, I'm in the higher education discipline and we work a lot with public institutions locally, a lot of which are two-year institutions. And a lot of our conversations are thinking about those who are marginalized, those who are often forgotten, um, late in life learners, those that have very precarious living conditions. How do we make sure that those spaces don't become sort of consolation prize, right? The, the other space that we provide for them, but it's clearly sort of over there, right? It's not central to the vision or ethos of what the campus or what the client wants to purvey. So tough conversations, but um, growing up has, has, made, has centered that in my day-to-day. -day. So to follow up on that question, I think all of you mentioned a big contrast as to what you guys experienced um, at home in contrast to public space. With a growing awareness of the importance of diversity and equity within architecture and space, um, what are some tips that perhaps you can give students um, as to what we can do within our own practices to increase design equity and justice? But also, what do you have as advice to those who are struggling with their design? And do you have any like any tips on for, for BIPOC folks here within CCA who need to gain confidence and perhaps? Yeah, I'll kick us off. Um, first of all, I don't think that the burden should be on students who are already navigating debt, um, like family obligations, uh, financial insecurity, and and a vicious, like institutionally racist place to make this change. So first of all, I think that the onus is on faculty and staff and administrators and practitioners uh, who are able to speak more from our platforms to lead that. Um, listening to and including and centering the experiences of the most vulnerable, which in this case are often students and also uh, folks who are working, in, uh, who, do, who are doing domestic and, and physical labor on our campuses to, to allow it to exist. Um, so, but with that said, I think that one of the big things that I would say to students um, is, you know, to, to, to kind of like, first, firstly, we need you to, we need you, firstly and we need you to survive and be well. So it, it means that, you know, something we say in design is protest a lot in our meetings is if everyone does a little, no one does a lot, right? So doing, doing work together and this theme of collective work in, in all of our presentations and all of our practices um, is, comes from that place of, of if everyone does a little bit, then no one has to do a lot and burn out um, because we lose like it's it's our loss when when you you experience burnout and we don't get to hear from you. Um, I think you know tying into the the initial question, Kaylee, and thank you for these thoughtful questions. Um, one also like just um, there's so much work there's there's so much that can't be done when we start from architecture and then try to solve things as design problems from architecture. It's actually the opposite. We actually have to go from that, you know, from our experiences in 
um, a lot of ways, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, for instance, like there's so much erasure already, but then there's like whitewashing that happens um, uh, on and like columbusing of concepts that exist in, in, in non-white and non-Western cultures. Like for instance, you know, uh, a couple of us in space industries did like a big experiential space research lab um, that we, you know, um, enjoyed in many ways and also raised a lot of questions that I would say about experiential space. Like for instance, as someone from a Chinese diaspora, like I cannot go to a Chinese space without like things blowing up in my face and like different foods for different, uh, for every single different festival has like a different food and a different color and a different like like fruit tree that you're supposed to know about or flower or like, you know, it's amazing. Like, how is that not experiential space? Why are we talking about it only through the, uh, like a, a, a San Francisco tech lens? <laughs> um, and it doesn't mean let's, that's bad or we hate it. It just means like, let's actually open up the conversation at least, you know, to something that has existed for much longer. Um, and I also would say like, you know, an experience that I've had at moving from being a student to being someone who's a teacher and a practitioner and organizer with someone with more um, more protection in my position is something that I've noticed in my own experience is that I have been able to um, or I have been afforded the opportunity to like add things back into my CV as I've gotten more security in my professional career. So I have been able to like add back in that I, you know, have this art background and art career that's concurrent with my architecture career, that I am an organizer in different spaces, that I have been in a union organizer. Um, that's one I've been afraid before to put on my CV, um, you know, that I, ha I care about environmental justice and I've done work in that realm is something I've had to filter out, uh, you know, when I was applying to internships. And I wish for us to, to stop needing to do that, but I also understand deeply and relate deeply to, to that fear and, and needing to like filter ourselves and, you know, to kind of leave things at the door, as I was saying. So I think that that, you know, that's something that I notice in myself that now I can say this and people will be like, oh, that's really cool. But when I was a student, they would say, do you even care about architecture or is this not your focus, right? So there's such a big power differential. And that's something that is a little like call in <laughs> to maybe to anyone who's listening, who, who is in a position of power now um, to, to think about how that shows up. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll build off that with a really quick, really quick um, uh, thought, which is just that I think for me, something that's really, really important is something, that, and this is like a little bit in contradiction to, to, to what B said in, in the very, very beginning, which is just that I don't think that the institutions that are looking to destroy and extract from us are ever going to remove the onus from being on us. Like, I just don't think that that's what's going to happen. And I think that the most important thing that happened to me in grad school was finding a community that was going to be able to prepare me for that inevitability because it's just simply not true that even the institutions that we're using right now to have this discussion have our best interests at heart. And it's not the fault of any one person at the institution, it's the nature of the setup of the institution. So Keith, please don't be upset with me. <laughs> but I mean, I think, I think the, the, nature of, the nature of these things is that, is that once you find your people, something really, really important happens. And this happens a lot when you travel as well, which is like, when you're around people who you're aligned with, you no longer have to treat your own experiences being an other experience. It just be, you you start to recenter yourself. And and my advice to those who are who are struggling, which is just like, treat your own experience as as truth, because it is it is truth, and you don't have to feel like it's alternative. It's also happening, right? And and I think we get so used to framing it as being alternative, even in my presentation, framing something like spatial violence as an unobject makes it seem like it's not an object, which it really is. You know, that's that's me code switching um, in some ways for interest, right? But like it's just as real. And and in my in my professional practice at a firm, that's been a, a great help to me is is figuring out and like these did mention the right time and the right place. Um, which will always be something that people need to think of to stay safe. But for example, right now, um, the firm I'm working for is working with Walter Hood, uh, with the AIA on, on doing an outreach program with HBCUs. 
And that whole thing is happening because people like Walter Hood and three black people in my office advocated for the AIA to, to do something and to, to, to do, to, to literally just to do anything. And, and it wouldn't have happened if we thought that it wasn't worth doing. We had to, we had to treat it as if it was just as valuable because that's the truth of it. And, and I'll, I'll leave with a quote from one of my favorite sci-fi authors, Samuel Delaney, who in, in this, this uh, book yeah. he wrote called Babel 17, which is all about the power of language as a weapon, he talks about three ways of viewing the world, simplex, complex, and multiplex. Simplex is thinking things are black and white. Complex is thinking that things are not just black and white, but there's something in the middle. And multiplex is realizing that there is no single point of reference and that every single thing is just as meaningful. And that's the attitude that I think is re was really helpful for me in my experience with grad school and with architectural education, which is that all of those points hold equal value. The difference between AAPI history, indigenous history, black history, white history, architecture, art, and all those things, those, those distinctions in the long run are pretty irrelevant. What's really relevant is, is that we treat them all respect, value. So that's, that's what I would say. That's really great. Um, so I wanted to build off of that um, statement that you made earlier about framing the perspectives. So in your views, for someone who wants to diversify their perspectives and design skills and portfolio, how can they do it in a way that is not tokenistic? Like, for example, the Noma Student Competition last year was basically to design a Black cultural hub negotiating cultural heritage and site for um, a site in Oakland. Um, I think for most students, they do not know much, well, for most students outside of the Bay Area, at least, um, like for my alma mater, UBC, most students do not know of or even have heard of Oakland, much less the, deep, the deeply rooted community history and culture. So how what? can, <laughs> yeah, how can, how can students really do, like, how can students really design in a way that it comes from a good place and does not come off as rude, disrespectful, or even appropriation or tokenistic? I'll, I'll kick this one off. Um, the, the idea of designing from a good place was like, for me sort of a trigger. Um, what is that good place, right? Like it's perhaps you shouldn't be designing from a good place. It's, it's someone else's place. And my mind is going in multiple tracks right now, which is it's a, it's a great question. Um, first off, everything you do in, in academia is real. And Kevin touched on that. Don't think of it, of a, don't think of it as an abstraction. It is real. Um, therefore, leverage real tools and real techniques and processes to make it real, meaning find people there, go there, learn about it. Um, don't think of it as an abstraction, right? Start with the people there, right? Start with conversations with those people. That, that's, that's like, I guess, one avenue to think about it. Um, and I guess my, my firm stance, because it's something that I had to think critically about when conducting studios in let's say San Francisco was the idea that we're projecting our own image onto a space that we don't fully understand and the tools that we have in the studio are often inadequate, right? Um, a two week exercise that looks at circulation flows and, you know, colors of, of you know, building faces is inappropriate. And we kind of need to cut that out of, of education stat, right? Um, we need to understand that understanding space is a a semester long and really sort of a, a, a lifelong exercise, learning how to communicate and extract information appropriately is lifelong. So when I say don't think of it as an abstraction, it's find the people there, like, you know, like that's, it's, I think that's a, um, an excuse, um, not necessarily of, of the students, but I think of faculty is like this excuse that we, we're only given a certain um, sort of amount of leeway to, to extracting data from spaces that for some reason leave out our ability to communicate and our, our um, sort of requirement to learn how to communicate with different types of people. If we think about ourselves as mediators, we need to be able to speak different languages, right? Because we're coordinating against city-based agencies, people on site, community-based organizations, um, the client, obviously. Like there's so many stakeholders that we need to mediate between and we don't stress enough what it means to be able to be that linchpin, that, that sort of in-between person. So, you know, um, 
I don't want to necessarily project um, some kind of generalizing in this next statement, but I think it's important for us to apply pressure to whoever's either constructing the studio. It's important to apply pressure to administration to make sure, make sure that the avenues are open for us to get to the real content, the real data, the real in, you know first person accounts of what's happening. Yeah, I mean, just to quickly say, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I love this question, Kaylee. And I'm also like, this is what I'm talking about. We can, we can, we can think about how what students can do, right? But it's actually who wrote the student competition that way? And why did we do that? And can we organize together as students and faculty and practitioners and um, and staff and admin, you know, to change that <laughs> brief? Um, so that we don't have to, it's, you know, it's like starting at the place of like, what do I do in this impossible situation, you know, to me is like, that's not even the, you know, like, I want to support you if you find yourself in that situation. But I actually want to organize with you so that we don't have, you don't have to be in that situation. And I think the question about like, you know, sometimes the best thing to do is not design. It's the same thing for edu design education. Like, what is what is design education really good at? And what is it really not good at? And can we focus on the ways that it's it's the strengths, you know, and focus on how, you know, those conversations that can be generated uh, because we're in an academic space and can we not try to do things that, you know, acad <laughs> academia is not good at? Yeah, I mean, this this makes me think of when we talk about tokenization, there's a, there's a prize at, at CED, the Branner. And it's always been really interesting to me that the Branner Fellowship is organized around a really old school architectural education idea of the grand tour, which is essentially you get money and they send you to all these places in Europe, specifically France. I think it's France, Italy, and, and somewhere else, one of those places. Um, I don't think it's England, but it's really interesting because it's just like, all right, so if you're going to apply for this thing, it's already set up to other literally the entire world that's not those three countries right it's just, it's set up in that way so that means that all the proposals that get proposed which are coming from international students students of color from all of these different backgrounds have to fit in to that grand tour ideal which is just a remnant of like ancient not ancient but you know like a much older tradition of architecture so when these is talking about like really questioning the people who are writing the assignments it's like, cause these assignments don't just die with your class, right? They get rewritten and re-encoded and reinstated and they become institutionalized in themselves. And so it's really, really important that like, at the first moment when that instruction was handed down, people are being really, really critical about it because the, the institution isn't gonna change unless pressure is applied to it, unfortunately. You know, and that that's gonna be extra work for those who are able to take it on, but it's just the way that that happens at this point in time. It's, it's up to us as instructors to figure out how to lessen that one. Yeah, I wanted to quickly add something um, just in, in that sort of um, like scheme of the action that I was mentioning earlier. This is literally a perfect example of what we like what I'm trying to push, at least in NOMAS, we're trying to create this idea of like instead of hosting these conversations which i keep mentioning we have had so many of these conversations of racial inequality we have spotted the problem now we have to think of like the solutions and sometimes applying the solution in an institutional scale which is what y'all are suggesting it's like such a big step that would actually lead and create more opportunity for a more inclusive design field but also a diversifying of the architectural production itself um and that's that, that that's one of the things that um like y'all are mentioning and and one of the, the qualities that um i think space industry individually and as a collective it's a really good explanation and just like a good example of what that kind of could like what that example of taking action could look like everybody's taking a different discipline responsibly with the design to make a collective and more inclusive um, project. And, and just like the research that goes behind every research, every part, every scale, and it can be so small, but also so big. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate about like the collective of space industry. And with that, um, we are a little bit um, <laughs> over schedule and 
uh, we would like to open it and we just kind of have like five minutes to open it up with um, if anybody has any questions um, and any of the our guests as well who are listening has any other additional questions that we can quickly address will be much appreciated. Um, I know that we said to open up the guests. I still have like sort of, I would love to hear like a few just more thoughts um, on, uh, we've, we've all kind of, we've already kind of touched here and there uh, in, in these points, but I think like, you know, really like a large part of this conversation is like the institution itself and uh, the egoism that comes with like thinking that uh, architects can, uh, that like such a, um, an industry that's rooted in such like a neoliberal colonialist capitalist framework can like hope to pretend to make uh, you know, realistic changes, uh, you know, it's really sort of disheartening or something or to like feel so powerless. Uh, and like, I think, you know, obviously we're all, we all believe in architecture. I think that's why we're here, but, uh, you know, like where, how do you sort of reconcile these things? Like what makes you keep going? Um, I mean, I, I, I want to say something really quick because I, I think it has a lot to do with the work that Bees does in her individual practice that I think I've learned a lot from that I don't know that much about. But, you know, there's this idea about coalition building that I didn't really understand until I was embedded in an institution that may or may not have been looking up for me. And, and I think that something that gives me hope about architecture and all these institutions that we're, we're talking about really generally is that institution, maybe out of all the things that we're saying are, are not abstractions and are real, maybe it's actually the institution that's the only thing that's really an abstraction because it's just yeah. comprised of individuals. And within those institutions there are individuals who, with whom you can coalition build, which is exactly how space industries inside of that institution, we all ran into each other in different ways, shapes and forms. We decided to build a coalition with each other. And through that coalition, we've been able to give talks and presentations. We've been able to organize coursework. We've been able to organize political action. And all of that happens because, because institutions are only as powerful as the people inside of them. And if you, can, if you can find your network within that institution, the institution will be forced to change, right? This happens whenever there's a changeover of administration or whenever you know, professors or lecturers get swapped out, drastic changes can happen. And so I would say that applying applying pressure, not just against the institution, but to, to your classmates who share your same uh, interests and things like that, you know, that you will become the institution of the future. We talk about institutions as if they rise from nowhere, but it's actually you, David and Arturo, and Kylie, you guys are also forming your own institutions and those institutions will shape the next phase of design. So I think that's what gives me inspiration is that it's not true that we don't have any control. It's just, it's literally just a matter of time. So I, I think that that was, that's something that helped keep me what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, and as, as a current student as well, um, alongside all you, everyone on this call pretty much, um, I'm like really benefiting by listening to my colleagues <laughs> dole out this great advice. Um, but I would say what I'm saying to myself in my program is to just be, be brave enough to follow your curiosities. So we're all here because we are upset or angry about something or there's something triggered in us, um, um, questions that we have that we want answered. Um, and so if you follow these curiosities and be brave enough to, um, I think Kristen said in the chat to, to challenge the brief, um, then you'll find your conversation, you'll find your, your folks, you'll find your lane, and um, alongside amplifying others who have found their conversation. And so I think what I've, what I've now, how I've navigated my virtual world is just pieces sort of falling into, into correct spaces, and then also looking laterally and reaching out your hand and saying like, how can I help you be better? 
Um, this is what I'm actively trying to work in through my process and what I think we do in space industries. Um, I mean, I ask BUs for desk credits all the time. Like, can you just look at this space? So I think like reaching out, finding a community coalition building um, and, and staying curious. I just want to jump in. We can, um, as long as it's okay with uh, Kevin B, Celeste and Jason, and Kylie, Arturo and David, we can go a little long. So um, please, I encourage uh, those of you in the audience, you can unmute yourselves, I believe. So if you have a question, unmute yourself uh, and ask or type it in the chat if you would prefer to do it that way. And, and maybe while we wait for one, um, I think Kevin's response about institutions is so spot on that you know institutions like through legacy and all sorts of things and wealth they do carry weight right and there's power in them as uh, uh, disembodied um, organizations but they're always comprised of individuals right um, and the coalition building I think that you described Kevin is is really a, a key thing to think about and also that um, we have an interview that we just put up on Scaffold with Anna Majachki from MIT, where she talks about collaboration, education as a form of collaboration between, you know, teachers and learners. And those roles are always in flux as well. So, you know, I think that's really key too. And that's, you know, I'll now mute myself. I mean, to maybe, to maybe uh, jumpstart some some conversation, you know, what are things that you guys feel like are disheartening or like what are some some things that you've encountered that that kind of feel make you feel like you are powerless, um, not just in an abstract sense, but I know that they're really real things that happen and um, you don't have to name them in public, of course, but, you know, just you know, I just rewatched Lovecraft Country. I reference a lot of stuff. But there's this one episode in, in that really great TV show um, where um, the whole episode is just about one of the characters, Hippolyta, naming herself and what happens when you're actually able to name a thing. And that's been a huge thing that's been going on, especially with the, the recent, you know, tragedies that have been happening. Just like call it what it is. Call, call me by your name. Like just say it. Just name it. And maybe the real thing is less about asking questions and it's more about like, can we start to name these things? That way we can deal with them. Okay, so maybe when waiting for another question. Um, I think there is a question slash oh. like re reflection. So I think Kristen had said in the chat that they would be, yeah. Oh yeah, Kristen, please. Please go ahead. Um, this is to, can you hear me? I don't know if you can hear me actually. You can? Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> so um, I guess I can turn on my video. But um, when I was, at school, one of the things that I struggled with, this is to like an earlier question and thought about um, about kind of being connected. And um, when I was at school, I really struggled with just not feeling connected because I had moved to go to grad school. And so I was just by myself in this new city, which was actually not that far from home, but still it was far. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, what helped for me was to just uh, find people <laughs> um, where I thought I, you know, I was interested in. So, like I, you know, I went to um, Haley House, uh, which is a nonprofit, but they, most importantly, they run a, like a an urban farm, um, and so I, I really like plants and I like food, and <laughs> so I was like, hey, let me go volunteer at this urban farm, and like. That was like, I think I saw on a therapist's like kind of IG like uh, feed, like to make sure that you have these, have a list of things that you will not compromise on, you know, like, so one of the things I would not compromise on is whenever there's a volunteer session at the farm, I would get my butt out of studio and <laughs> go bike over there um, and help plant some plants. And so whatever that is for you, like it could be, I don't know, a ceramics class, or it could be 
um, I, I don't know, right? It could be a lot of different things, right? Uh, I feel like that was something that's really helpful. And then, and then guess what? You're like, you're contributing as a member of the, of the community to a certain extent. And later on this, this community that I formed uh, this relationship with uh, inspired a part of my thesis project. So, you know, and it's like, I volunteered with them for a year before I was like, oh, hey, you need help with some, you know, uh, visioning around something or, or um, you know, are you interested in this, like, in this game? Because I like to play games. So I, you know, just, I'm going to land the plane, but basically uh, try to I feel like if you're a student and you're kind of struggling with being like, oh, I don't know if I should design this or like trying to come at this from, come at a studio brief from a certain angle or whatever, it's like, um, just become, be a part of the community, you know, and, uh, and it will also help with just finding yourself too. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, Ian uh, would like to hear more about the collective aspects of a uh, space industry. How does the structure of the group provide um, for yourself? Does the work cross uh, pollinate? Uh, uh, do you give each other weekly desk grids like Celeste was saying? Um, I think that's something that will be interesting to hear. I, I think I mentioned it earlier at some point. Um, also the dynamic, the way that space industry was composed will be really interesting to acknowledge and, and, and just be part of that um, experience of how that came to be in a more structural and like that acceptance of like, let's do this, you know? Um, or if it just happened, just, freely and all of a sudden you guys were exercising this. Um, so there's open, there, there's the question if, if you guys don't mind answering. I love the like um, reenactment video of us coming up to each other and being like, let's do this. <laughs> but it's honestly not that far from the truth in a way because I met Kevin because uh, there was a NAB accreditation meeting at UC Berkeley for our MARC program in 2016 and Kevin was in the year ahead of me and I was in my first semester and I just I sat in this auditorium listening to random things that were being said and not said and I was so confused and this is totally only from my personal perspective um, and and Kevin was one of the only students in the audience who had said anything but just like made a point to be like i'm actually going to speak up um so i i found him after and was just like that was Ouch. bizarre that was weird like that made me upset and you were the only one who said something so what's going on like can we talk about this you know so i do think that you and like that's sort of the literal where we come from i think when we say like find your people or like find you know and, and have each other's backs. Um, I also really have benefited and learned a lot from Jason's practice at, with Elle of the like, you know, being who uh, we need to be when we need to be that, you know, and I, I didn't say it right, Jason, <laughs> feel free to <laughs> say it correctly <laughs> in the chat or something. But, you know, I think that when people ask us a lot, like, how do you maintain this structure or how do you organize yourselves? Um, and, and I, I don't think that any of us means to be purposefully vague. The, 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 the actual answer is that it shifts all the time. Um, and I think recently, um, we've had a lot of requests from folks, uh, really exciting opportunities that we've turned down because we're, we're three of us are teaching. One of us is in two graduate programs at the same time. Um, and we just can't take it on and it wouldn't be respectful to ourselves and our own well-being to do so and so right now it's been a a kind of period of like laying low um and supporting each other as Celeste was saying with like you know just a call I just talked to Jason the other night um it was so lovely um to have his support you know and like so you know we we talk Celeste and I will will talk through what's going on with 
at our different institutions and Kevin and I are co-teaching this course at CCA, which, you know, speak of um, choosing to do something else that, you know, this is like Brian Price and, and Keith, like reaching out to me and Kevin a, a little apropos of like not that much encountering each other, which is why I appreciate so much. Like we kind of built that trust to be like, let's make this course um, work. Um, and that and that that is something that um, actually I, I will say like not a lot of institutions are doing um, and could just by inviting people in to to, to uh, create the course that they know how to make, but that maybe an institution hasn't seen before. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, now I want to jump in quickly because um, I'm thinking now of my origin story with bees. I think it was Tom Brush at that point, the chair of the architecture program at I just remember I was in the middle of review and Tom came over with UB saying, hey, Jason, this is B. She also does not like architecture and then just walked away. And that was like, that was our origin story, um, which obviously sort of was a nice point of departure to unpack like what that meant for both of us. And that ambiguity, I think, is a sort of a strength that we can sort of ebb and flow into this institution when we need to ebb into the institution, right? Like last year, we converged pretty intensely because there was something that needed to be produced and then we sort of moved apart and then bees and kevin connect and i've been connecting with bees on home production and she was involved early on with l so like we we ebb and flow when we need to which i think i think it says something about the sort of new institution which is like leverage its formality but also keep in mind what you can take advantage of its informality Right, like be nimble. Yeah, I mean that's that's like I feel I can't I can't spell apparently, but anyway, um, I I think that that's that's exactly what space industries is is for me is like you know I look at corporations like Google and how they're constantly forming reforming, like breaking into parts. Now I'm Alphabet. Now I'm mag mag Magenta. Now I'm whatever. And these are techniques that I feel like organizing communities are so hesitant to adapt, um, but they're not, they're not owned by oppressors, right? Being tricky and being flexible is not owned by any one, any one person. It's, it's a strategy, right? It's, it's a strategy to do work. And I think, you know, there's a large, there's a large part of me that, you know, for me, space industries is almost like a, it's almost like a joke. It's almost just like, if we told people we were a firm, would we then be a firm? And I'm just here to let you know that the answer is yes. If you tell people, that you're a firm, you become a firm. That's all it is. That's all a museum is. That's all a company is. That's all a corporation is. You know, and all it all it takes is once you yeah exactly once you name it, it becomes real. You know, having a good name helps. I'm really proud of the name Space Industries. We workshopped it, but we I will, it. <laughs> I'll add really quickly that there's a real trade-off, as you can tell from the four of us. Like we are we ha are employed by way more than four things. You know we're partially employed by many different other institutions. We don't, we have made very little money at, through our collective work, right? So it's a trade-off. But if we had incorporated immediately, I don't think we would have been able to use our platform or do the kinds of things that we've been able to do as four people, right? And we were aware of that. So I, I think that's a much longer conversation about like types of firms and types of collectives, but I just wanted to add that. Yeah, that connects a little bit of the thing. Um, this idea of this kind of like modern, we could say, Neon's way of creating a group to exercise collectively. I really love the dynamic that you guys are explaining. Um, and I want to expand a little bit the question of like, it, it, it's, it's more of like, how do you guys like set your like boundaries or Kind of like, was this thing always virtually? Uh, considering the fact that each one of you have like different experiences, and it sounds like right now y'all are like distributed across different areas. And has this always been like that? Or was there a time when everybody was collectively together in one single space? And how was that? And how was the transition to this like pandemic virtual like setup? But also, like, I understand you guys are individually in your own path, but also collectively in this, like, 
I want to call it like brother sisterhood sort of like boundary but like siblinghood if that's a new term or something you can but just call it the hood that's fine the, too I like that <laughs> um and it, it's just it, I I love it I love that bat like that flexibility and especially us who are in an institute who is somewhat promising of like when you leave you have a job you know like that sort of thing that like you can exercise this after um like your degree i love the the dynamic just how flexible and and, and relaxed it could be that's just one of the examples but of course we're not going to go in depth into this whole other groups but i'm curious to hear a little bit about the previous experience the middle experience and the further like the future like how do you guys see space industries moving forward I don't know if I, I'll hit on all of those, but I'll definitely start by saying that we have seen each other's shoes and lower halves. <laughs> um, we all were in the Bay Area at one point together um, in before 2020. Um, so between the years of, I guess, oh my gosh, like 2015 to 2020. Um, so I wanna pick up on your point though about um, the fluidity of space industries. What I like is that um, I am currently a student, Jason is an associate, and Bees and, and Kevin are um, instructors of an equivalent studio at CCA. Um, and yet we all are able to join in and have conversations together um, as architectural producers. And so I think what is so special to me and what I wanna challenge other people and if anyone on this call who's interested in starting a coalition or joining a firm is, thinking about um, how the relationships are set up between instructor and student or teacher and student or, um, and even in employment settings too, and that it's so fluid. You can become one, you can be one tomorrow and be the other. Um, you can be one today and become one tomorrow. So I think um, entering into conversation with people of different generations um, from different places is so important to hold as near and dear to your practice, or at least to my practice. I just want to jump in quickly on that too, because um, this idea of designing the relationship, I think is super important um, because it should be synergistic in a way, right? Um, you want to make sure that there are very clear boundaries, but that through your very carefully curated touch points, that something amazing is produced. And I see it happening in, in space industries. Obviously we, we make really clear touch points um, for certain reasons, but just to use like Elle as an example, just because like money was like a, a serious factor to, to its longevity was like, I had to be very clear as to what L was um, and how it's different sort of faces could link at careful moments to be cash flow positive. And I think that's, something we need to be mindful of as you know individuals going out into the real world is like how do i do what i want to do also make money you know and have it happen at the same time right it's like a it's a very real question that we have to deal with and i think not, i'm not saying it's something that is going to be a constraint i'm actually saying thinking this way designing the process designing the connections will actually make you more profitable and then you know therefore doing more of what you want to do i'm, I'm gonna have to hop off really quick so i just want to try to give my little two cents and then I'm, I'm gonna have to say goodbye to everybody, but not forever, of course. In fact, some of you I'll be seeing quite soon. Um, what I want to say is I think something that really is, is important to me about space industries and about the work that we all do together and separately is that it's action-based. So, so I think it's, it's about like, okay, we have a talk. Okay, we have a document we're preparing. Okay, we have an event that we're trying to put together. Okay, we have an installation that we're trying to do. And then I think the word that I've said before then we form up like Voltron, you know, and I think, and I think that that's, that's important because like, you know, like maybe that's like a foundational memory for me, like things like Power Rangers and Voltrons and, but it's like all about people who have their individual strengths yeah. and they form up when the threat is too big to, to, to be taken care of by, by one person. And I think that that's really where our strength comes from, um, is that when we work together, we just know that we have, we have more power together to do these specific things. Um, but it also gives us the flexibility to go deeper into our little niches when we want to. And I think that that's really, really important. Um, and then in terms of just like coming together in general to one of the things that Arturo was asking about is um, 
you know, we leave school and they make you a lot of promises about you're going to get a job and all that stuff. And everybody in this in this call has actually already lived through two recessions, some of us going on three or four. And I think the, the, the truth is that the thing that you're going to leave school with is going to be the people that you're in school with, whether it's good memories or bad memories. And those will be the things that will last much longer. And I'm not trying to make this into a cheesy remember the Titan speech. But I think the fact of the matter is like, if you take care of those relationships, they'll morph and they'll change, but they'll benefit you. Um, and that goes for outreach inside your community at school and also outside into the community. Not like for those who are international students coming to a place, you know, digging into that community, learning about that community, for those who have always been in the Bay Area or wherever they're going to school, you know, those will be the connections that will last with you as I think uh, Kristen pointed out with her story about how, how she found some of her thesis inspiration. So, you know, take care of your people, you know, and be flexible. And with that, I'm out. Love you all. Love Space Industries, love CCA. See you guys later. So maybe that's a, a good place to wrap up because um, we do want to respect people's time. Um, I want to thank you all, um, David, Kylie, Arturo, for um, like making this happen. Like bringing this forward is something we want to do. Uh, Bees, Celeste, Jason, Kevin, and Absentia, um, for sharing your time and your experience and your expertise and actions and relations with us all. Incredibly inspiring, powerful work um, to see how each of you carry forward your practices and how those practices are strengthened through your comradeship with one another and with, with I'm sure we know many who are not on this call, right? Um, the many comrades we work with. So really beautiful, inspiring. Um, and again, thank you. And thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, Nomas, you want to send us off here? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days. And, you know, I just want to say on behalf of Nomas, like we all really, really appreciate everything that was brought up today. And you've definitely given us and I'm sure everyone in the audience just so much to think about and process in the next few days, but thank you so much. I echo that, you know, those thanks, like this was incredibly inspiring and like we, yeah, we want to thank you all so much for, you know, as young uh, architects to architecture students, it's just, it's incredible to see that this is like, you know, what we can do. And, and I want a, a big shout out and thank you to Malia um, on our staff here at CCA and to Sarah, who's not with us today, unfortunately, but um, for the work that they did, Dustin Smith, um, everyone who is just crushing it um, at CCA to make the, the things we do happen. Yeah, um, just to wrap up, thank you so much again. And um, it was a great event and we're looking forward to have more and um, yeah. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.